My thanks to Derry City and Straban District Council for their invitation to present this pre-recorded lecture. The past is a crowded place. It's always calling out to us and claiming our attention. The figures from history who succeed in their claim do so for a variety of reasons. Some are accidental, some political, some have to do with our families and many other reasons. A complex process preserves or unearths or sometimes generates a memory of historical figures and something in us responds. We're about to celebrate an important anniversary of Columcillus, or Columba as he's sometimes known in English, Columcilla in Scottish Gaelic. 1500 years after his birth, he's still remembered and celebrated in a complex weave of texts. Some of those have been written down. For instance, we have accounts of his life that have varying degrees of plausibility. We have beautiful religious poems, some said to have been composed by himself and some definitely about him. And some of the texts are from the oral tradition, a huge store of stories about him that have been preserved for hundreds of years in Ireland and Scotland. Our knowledge of him and our stories about him have been weaving in and out of the written record almost since writing came to Ireland. He was important in his time and he remains important through his legacy for many reasons. In this talk, I'm concentrating on the relationship between Gaelic Ireland and Gaelic Scotland in that context. My focus will be mainly on Irish perceptions and Irish perspectives. Cullen Killa has an important symbolic role in the Scottish-Irish relationship. A recent map showing just Ireland and Scotland calls the two countries together Tír Cullen Killa, Columbus Land. You can see what it looks like when you strip away the rest of the archipelago. You can see how the two, what are now two countries, form what seems to be a unity, how close they are. Um, the distance between them is so short, say by boat nowadays, that you could spend as long working your way around the outskirts of Dublin on a bad traffic day. In honouring Cullum Killa this year, we honour and delight in the close sisterhood of Ireland and Scotland, symbolised by him with all its nuances. Now we do well to reflect on those nuances because they can tell us a lot about who we are and what the words we and they mean. We will find undeniably rifts and chasms, but these are in so many cases to be welcomed and we will find an intense affinity. Colum Killer and his monks sailed away from Ireland and travelled until they found a place in Scotland from which the land of Ireland could not be seen with a backward glance. There they settled on Iona. He did that as a penance. So exile and separation were part of what Scotland meant for Cullum Killia going over from Ireland. We're told in some of our important texts how he felt sorrow at leaving and even the birds were sorrowful. The idea that nature, and in this case the birds, is in sympathy with great heroes and saints is deeply rooted in the Gaelic tradition. To say that the birds screeched in distress is a way of saying that for Cullum Killa and for Ireland, his leaving was a source of grief. Here's a translation of what Manus O'Donnell's 16th century life of Cullum Killa, Baha Cullum Killa, has to say about it. Not only were the people of his own land full of grief and sorrow after Cullum Killa, the birds and dumb beasts were sorrowing too. In proof of that, the seagulls and other birds around Loch Foyle 
came all around his boat as he left, screeching and wailing. They were so distressed at his leaving Ireland. That's the 16th century text. The modern folklore records, which are housed in University College Dublin, date from later, usually recorded in the 20th century, and they yield up some poignant accounts as well. Here's one from Donegal. Bi Colum Killa in Thakburha Nurivia Kilashan Tidogal. Colum Killa was very sad when he had to leave the country. The trees were all covered with crows. The crows followed the little boat that he and his company sailed in down to the mouth of the Loch Swilly, singing away. They're certainly not good musicians, but they satisfied him. Colum Killa blessed them and went on his way. Stories like those point to the fact that Scotland was not home. It was different. Going there brought homesickness. Today, ironically, we experience a different sort of exile. Gaelic Ireland and Gaelic Scotland share a lustrous and deeply rooted cultural and linguistic tradition. But too often, speakers of each of those languages or dialects consider the culture of their counterparts more a place of exile than we should, more different perhaps than we should, more they and less us. But we need not endure exile like Colin Killa. We can rejoice in and foster the connections and the affinity between Scotland and Ireland that are so manifest without abandoning either. It's not all plain sailing though. In spite of the valiant efforts of the organisation known as Callum Killia, which is a joint initiative of the Scottish, Northern Irish and the Republic governments, there is still too much exile and not enough closeness. Now, there are several factors, perfectly obvious factors that have contributed to this over, say, the past hundred years, say, more or less since the time of the Gaelic revival. First of all, it's easy to say that there was and is a shared Gaelic language across Ireland and Scotland. But we need to remember that a language can mean many things. Right up until the 17th century, the Queen of the Arts, which was poetry, was composed in a form of Gaelic that was widely shared by people of what is sometimes referred to as high culture in both countries. But we know that at the popular level, <coughs> excuse me, the languages had been diverging for several hundred years by then, and they have continued to diverge in the meantime, right up to the present day. This means, for instance, that when I first started going to Scotland in the early 1980s, I could read Gaelic poetry from the 17th century, no bother, but I was stuck when I tried to have a conversation about the weather or the holidays or <clears throat> anything else at all with my kind and patient hosts, Mary Kate Morrison and her family on South Uist. That initial difficulty of mutual incomprehensibility is something that needs to be addressed. <clears throat> and if I may say so without special pleading, it's one of the reasons why universities and colleges are so important in the construction and fostering of new links across the Sea of Moyle. It's relatively easy to clarify to students of Irish who already have a good command of the language that what may seem like a huge chasm between Irish and Gaelic is easily enough bridged with a little knowledge of the rules that are at play. <clears throat> Yet, <clears throat> and this is as much a challenge as special pleading, hundreds of students graduate with a degree in Irish every year, but very often do so without a sense of the centrality of Scottish Gaelic, and in certain cases, without ever having encountered it at all. We Irish speakers rightly object 
when lists or collections of great Irish writers or poets ignore the treasures of the Irish language. And we should examine our consciences too. How many of us, for instance, if asked to name those they considered the greatest Gaelic poets of all time, would include Scottish names? So issues of comprehensibility exist, but are not insuperable. People used to say the same about the various dialects of Irish when Radio na Gaeltacht first started broadcasting in the 1970s. We got over that. We can get over it today between Ireland and Scotland too, when there's such an impressive array of resources open to learners. My students are wonderful at letting me know of this or that new website they've found. and So much is available electronically now. Coronavirus aside, travel is easier and more affordable than it used to be. And when I say used to be, I'm going back centuries. There's a great poem from the late 13th century in which an Irish poet, probably Gilliblee de Macanmi, pleads with Angus of Isle to send on payment for the poem he had composed for him because he just can't face another sea journey to go across to collect it himself. You'll find that poem edited in Dunar and Nisrakara, edited by Wilson MacLeod and Meg Bateman. You can almost hear the rasp in the poet's voice. There's no need for that today. There's also the fact that in Ireland, at least, Irish became enmeshed in cultural nationalism to the unfortunate exclusion of other contexts. It acted around the time of the Irish revival as an identifying mark of Irishness at a time when Ireland closed the gates and pulled up the cultural drawbridge. That was a discouragement to Irish speakers from forging alliances with Gaelic speakers across the water. And in addition, for most of the 20th century, there was the difficulty of what might euphemistically be called unecumenical relations between different Christian denominations. These political and religious contexts distorted the truth and need to be challenged. The Western world has gradually come to recognise the great exclusions it has perpetrated, most recently through the very welcome Black Lives Matter movement. Working to eliminate the exclusion of women has also been a huge ongoing project for at least 50 and arguably for hundreds of years. Legislation now lists a number of grounds on which certain groups of people are routinely discriminated against and excluded. I'm not suggesting that the blindness of certain speakers of Irish or their Scottish Gaelic counterparts is an equivalent in moral terms. No, but when any group excludes or ignores those who can legitimately be considered part of themselves, and who then go on to treat themselves as the totality and really believe they are the totality, there is a failure to recognise the truth of who they are. I don't want to press too heavily on questions of identity, but they do exist. That diminishes them all and ignores the fact that we all have layers of overlapping identities. Neither Scottish Gaelic nor Irish is complete without the other, any more than, say, either Ireland or Scotland is complete without embracing their respective diasporas. It's easy to fall into the trap of believing that one's own subgroup is the totality, and it's easy to recognise it when it happens. For instance, my students, year after year, coming fresh to Scottish Gaelic, are amazed at the idea that there could be more than double the number of native speakers of Gaelic in Scotland than in Ireland. I know the concept of the native speaker is a bit problematical, but leave that aside. They also find it astonishing that Scottish Gaelic speakers could support Rangers or join the British Army. 
and even less that they could go on to write about their experiences in Gaelic, in some beautiful texts. To efface the awareness of a shared language and culture is an insult to truth, certainly. It can also be calamitous in a more immediately political way. The late and great Aidan MacPaulin argued that current widespread attitudes to the Irish language in the north of Ireland are deeply unhistorical, where we have hostility among so many Protestants and Unionists and the idea of exclusive possession by Catholics or nationalists. Aidan argued that since religious adherence has waned drastically, culture is taking its place as a marker of identity. He saw the need to ensure that the Irish language not be a mark of division, but part of the shared heritage that history shows it to be. And the properly understood historically, the language transcends the nationalist unionist divide, not adds to it. Ireland, Irish is not the preserve of the Catholic South, nor is it as Gaelic exclusively Scottish. It is shared between the peoples, Catholic, Protestant, other, possibly none, of Ireland and Scotland. Truth is not served when Gaelic speakers, wherever they are, narrow their interpretation of the word we, that's W-E. But why stop there? At a European level, it would be strange if Irish and Scottish Gaelic were not close allies and collaborators within the patchwork of lesser used languages across Europe. The European Union counts 60 regional or minority languages within its borders, and those are only the ones it terms indigenous. To speak any one of those languages is a privilege. It's a, it's a pearl of great price. It means that you hold precious, something that is intrinsic to the diversity within the unity that Europe, and not just the European Union, represents. It is to believe that not everything has to be of immediate practical use. It is to be part of a network that represents a different type of globalism from the globalism that would argue that knowing English is enough in today's world. It is deeply political. It defends the rights of small groups and the value of diversity rather than searching for the lowest common denominator. For the sister languages or dialects of Irish and Scottish Gaelic not to interact closely with each other would be a strange denial of all that minoritized languages can stand for and represent. So yes, I sign up to the political potential of Gaelic in Ireland and Scotland and more broadly across Europe. But there's more to life than truth and politics. There's also a dazzling beauty and the shock of recognition that can floor you and that has been flooring me for the last 40 years. I've been arguing that our differences should not be overstated, but they should not be understated either, because to an extent, it's the differences alongside the familiarity that makes you catch your breath. The affinity between Gaelic speakers, their language and culture is extraordinary but they are not happily completely identical groups. There are stories in Scotland, almost but not quite like Irish stories. There are songs that we know have a resounding ring of universal human truth about them, that we also recognize as having been drawn from the same well of, as Irish songs in language or imagery or rhyming scheme or tone, but then we suddenly find the tunes are subtly different. In the song, Myra Thog, for instance, 
the young man who accidentally killed his beloved new wife when she was out washing clothes in the loch and he was sent out to shoot ducks, which John McGuinness reminds us is a version of the uh, Swan Lake story. He describes, the young man describes her eyes as bluer than frockens or bilberries on a quiet morning and says she herself was brighter than snow falling on the high moors. This is very familiar to us in Ireland. There are many versions of the song on the website of Tupper and Dulchish, but my favourite is Christine Primrose's version on her sumptuous CD, Gunshilig Gunyiri. And here we will focus on what is so familiar to us. Stu's Gudemasul, Savatin Hune, Nan Jark at Hoon and Dulyakan, Gurgilu Rai Nan Shnach Kaban, Hakurer Art, Namonian. And we hear references here to so many Irish songs where we have we are we have snow falling on the high hills and the beauty of the eye. Have I that all storing on all? Is Kalak Moya Horahu? Stus Kuramasul Samatin Hun Nanyar Kit Hoot Nanunyakan. Stus Kuramasul Samatin Hun Nanyar Kit Hoot Nanunyakan. Good Kilukra. We will also hear similar approaches to many, many other ideas, ideas about the fertility of the land, to the attentiveness of humans to the land and of the land to humans, which is so important in today's climate emergency, the way you praise great deeds, the way you praise the beautiful, how the land can, can become sacred, how we lament, how we encourage, how we set down roots. All of these things we can find so familiar in Scottish Gaelic. And then it is a beautiful shock to find in addition, that Scottish Gaelic stretches out our shared language in exhilarating ways. We are surprised to find works of such exquisite beauty being produced in a language so close to our own and about which we knew next to nothing. Scottish internationalism in subject matter and outlook right throughout the 20th century is also reassuring. And it is also reassuring, perhaps, to find that within Ireland, when we needed to, Irish poetry and Irish literature focused inwards and went searching for its own roots. So we have differences and expansions. One of the most striking expansions into difference is Gaelic psalm singing. The music is very different from our experience in Ireland, and yet the texts of the Psalms are so familiar. Gaelic Psalms are spellbinding. To my mind, they are one of Europe's great expressions of religious faith, and they have a musical form that would transport you. Here's just a few lines from Psalm 118, verses 15 to 16. The words in Gaelic and English will be familiar to all Christian denominations in Ireland, but the music, however, will not, at least to Irish speakers or most of them. Although a version of the tune, which is called Coles Hill in Scotland, is ironically found in a different form in certain Irish churches where it's known as the Dublin tune. I'm informed of this by my colleague, Brian O'Higgin who is the greatest authority on Gaelic Psalms that I have met in Ireland. 
The recording we'll hear is was made on the island of, of the Isle of Lewis in 2003 under the inspiration and direction of Callum Martin. I consider it one of the great honours of my life that I was present at that recording. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. Good God. certainly gaps that, that are quite striking to Irish people when they encounter Scottish Gaelic. There's no real equivalent in Scotland for Ireland imagined as a goddess or later as an otherworldly woman abandoned by her spouse. That's quite a significant difference. Though we do encounter the Cailleach, who is the hag, a version of the land goddess, um, popping up in place names and in some unexpected places. She often holds on to her Irish affiliation, as Garrod O'Cruelly has analysed for us in the Book of the Cailleach, and she continues very often to be known as Cailleach Vera. She does appear, and I've recently heard a lovely poem by uh, Katrina Lexi Campbell invoking the Cailleach. In reflecting on the losses and gains between Gaelic Ireland and Gaelic Scotland over history, we may start with Cullum Killa, but we don't need to finish with him. I would choose the poet Sorley MacLean, Sorley MacLean in English, as a recent symbol of our shared passion and creativity. In speaking of him, I include two others with whom he was closely connected. His brother Callum, and the unnamed Irish woman with whom he fell in love and who caused him great heartbreak. Not only heartbreak, she also seems to have released the poet in him. In one of his poems, he says, Rainu bar stiam le dorin, you made a poet of me from grief. Her presence as his inspiration has had a transfiguring effect on Gaelic poetry. Sorla was a poet whose life spanned almost the whole of the 20th century. He was born and lived a good deal of his life in the general area of Raze, Skye and Lochalsh on the west coast of Scotland, from where I happen to be recording this lecture. He was by any standards one of the greatest Gaelic poets of all time. It is part of Scottish literary folklore that everyone remembers where they were when they first read his unforgettable collection, Thine the Ever or Poems to Ever, in which his anguished love poetry exploded onto the world. Seamus Heaney famously said that Maclean's poetry had the force of revelation. He spoke of its mesmeric, heightened tone, the weathered voice coming in close from a far place, 
the surrender to the otherness of the poem. The young woman who inspired this initially was a young scholar in the 1930s, a young Irish woman, who went on to study the Fíniacht, which is a body of stories and lays about the Fianna that were shared in Ireland and Scotland and that generated many place names and stories in both countries. So Orly chose not to name her, and I'll respect that here, although her identity is widely known. We can be grateful that an extraordinary transcendent body of poetry should have been inspired by such a recent example of Irish-Scottish attraction, even if, like Cullum Killer's heartache at leaving Ireland, it involved intense personal pain. His brother, Callum MacLean, was an eminent folklore collector in Ireland and Scotland around the middle of the last century. He spent some of the war years in Connemara. His amiable personality and his folklore collection are still remembered in Ireland as a standout early post-revival element in the development of Irish and Scottish comradeship. His brother Sorda's lament for him after his untimely death makes this very clear and memorialises Callum beautifully. But the poems speak of him as having been loved in Ireland in a manner which almost annulled the separation between Gaelic Ireland and Gaelic Scotland. Vau a Gael Eiring ar er yu hain is gen hlaum. Ghanich at unutse an yele nach de reip an kuan nach de vil miele bliona. You were as one of their own to Gaelic Ireland. They recognised in you the generosity of spirit that the ocean could not tear apart and that a thousand years could not destroy. So we return to the, in our heads to the map I showed you at, earlier on, where the sea can be seen to link Ireland and Scotland and not act as a, a, a force for division. Soria, Callum and the Irish woman remind us that passionate attraction and great and enduring patience across Tír Callum Killia will help us in the future to maintain strong and beautiful bonds. Thank you. <laughs>